dependent on human nature, empirical nature, obviously. But sometimes the way he makes his point is by saying that they apply to other rational creatures or other uh, creatures with um, an autonomous will. So here he's not saying that there are, in fact, Martians. Um, and he's also not saying that we can know that angels or God exist. These are entities that are beyond possible experience. Right? That was the whole point of the first critique. But we can imagine that. We can imagine God. We can imagine an angel. So an angel we can think of as a creature that is purely rational, non-material, not subjected to empirical desires and drives, but a creature that acts purely on the basis of practical reason. And so if we imagine that, then they will be bound by the principles of pure practical reason. Uh, and so um, those principles cannot be grounded in empirical facts about us. On the other hand, let me say that um, the application of those pure principles to us very well may require empirical um, investigation, empirical uh, input from the facts of the condition under which they're being applied. Um, so, although it will become important to understand the desires and inclinations that people have in different forms of society, all these are empirical, in order to figure out what morality required in certain circumstances, uh, the justification of those first principles has to be pure. That's the separating out the two points. Further. bottom of page 5, right above 390, he says, the application of these principles to specific cases, so to figure out what morality requires me to do here and now in this circumstance, the application to certain circumstances, of course, he says, still requires a power of judgment sharpened by experience partly to distinguish in what cases they are applicable, partly to obtain for them access to the, to the will of a human being and momentum for performance, since he, as himself affected by so many inclinations, empirical desires, is indeed capable of the idea of a practical pure reason, but not so easily able to make it effective in concrete in the conduct of his life. Um, Okay, so first of all, although the fundamental principle of morality is justified a priori, this doesn't mean that babies are born knowing it any more than they're born knowing mathematics. Um, or, now he's saying, that knowing the principle, the, the, the pure principles of practical reason, uh, doesn't always effectively motivate that sometimes we are overcome by our inclinations. Um, and, and the way that these abstract principles get applied to particular cases, he says, is through the faculty of judgment. And Kant was um, very clear, he was explicit, in fact, it's on the handout, the quote from the Pure Reason, that uh, judgment is necessary in order to apply rules to particular cases, that rules don't apply themselves. And so this application of abstract principle to concrete cases, this is something that we become more skilled at through practice. And this takes empirical work. Okay, here now is another reason why um, uh, why it's so important to identify the pure part of the metaphysics of morals. Um, since our human motivation 
is often mixed. We are moved by our empirical desires as well as by practical reason. There's often a temptation to corrupt our motives and to rationalize what in fact is selfish conduct. So we human beings, because we're pulled by our empirical desires and inclinations, we want to do what will satisfy our desires. We're often going to be tempted to try to rationalize them, to try to give a justification for them even when we can't do so. And so he thinks that only if we identify the pure part of practical reason very clearly will we be able to identify clearly when our motives are corrupted and when we have a mere rationalization and when we're actually acting in accordance with reason. Because, the very bottom of page 5, this is 390, he says, for in the case of what is to be morally good, it is not enough that it conform with the moral law, but it must be done, but it, but it must also be done for its sake. If not, he says, that conformity is only very contingent and precarious, because the immoral ground will indeed now and then produce actions that conform with the law, but in many cases actions that are contrary to it. Okay, so um, we don't really have an argument here yet, uh, but um, there is the possibility, he's saying, for an act based on our inclination. Uh, there's a possibility of an action based on the desires that we happen to have being in conformity with the requirements of morality. That is, the outward appearance of the action is the same, even though there might be different reasons for doing it. Uh, so, sorry, uh, uh, let me give an example. Um, I'll, I'll give the example that Kant gives later on. Um, so, it's a requirement that, um, I'll do a slight variation. So, it's a requirement that um, I keep my promises. It's a moral requirement that I keep my promises. Um, so if I promise to meet you at a certain time and place, and now it comes time for me to fulfill that promise, well, I may have a desire to do something else instead. But because I made that commitment to you, it's a moral requirement for me to fulfill. To be so there's a case where my desire, the thing that I would prefer to do, that I would like to do, conflicts with what's required. But of course, it might happen that I have a desire to be at that very place regardless of my commitment to it. So it's possible for the desire that I have to be in accordance with what morality requires just by coincidence. Okay, so what Kant is saying here is that if I'm there just because I happen to feel like it, I happen to have a desire to do that, uh, maybe outwardly I've conformed to the requirement, but my motive was not a virtuous motive. I did it just because I happened to feel like it, rather than because I recognized it was a moral requirement. Okay, so, um, um, for Kant, morality is a matter of more than just outward appearance, more than just conformity in one's outward behavior to what's required. In order to make a moral assessment of a person, we need to look not only at their outward behavior, but at their motive, the reasons why they behave as they do. Um, okay, so we'll see that more 
1967, then he mentions that he's going to public, publish a full metaphysics of morals. This is only the groundwork to it. Um, and a defense of practical reason as well. Um, so this foundation needs, uh, he says, a critique of pure practical reason. Um, and this groundwork is an exposition of that also. Um, so I mentioned last time that uh, he did publish a critique of practical reason, so-called second critique. Um, although interestingly there, he denies the need for a critique of pure practical reason. Um, there's only a need for a critique of practical reason insofar as it applies to imperfect rational beings like us. But even here, he thinks further down on um, page seven, um, that there's not the